Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back at ICTP. It's uh, one of my favorite places to come, and especially uh, lecturing here. I understand that there are uh, 50 countries represented here in the audience, which is, wow, that's pretty cool. So I'm going to be talking about supersymmetry. Um, here's a list of some of the topics. Can you see this thing? OK. Here's a list of, the list of some of the topics I want to cover, uh, but I'm not going to spend time introducing it. I'm just going to go right in. Let me just say that this is a vast subject. Uh, there's an enormous literature on it. There's no way I can uh, do justice to all of it and do it uh, uh, in all of it in detail. And so um, I'm going to be doing different things at varying levels of detail. So in the beginning, I'm going to be quite detailed, hopefully to, uh, with the formalism to make sure that the formalism is, is, is concrete and that you have something that you can really uh, use to start uh, uh, doing calculations on your own. And then when we get into the more phenomenological aspects, it's going to be more of a survey. Okay? Frankly, I haven't really prepared, I've only prepared sort of about a third of this. Okay? So uh, based on how things go today, I'm going to figure out how to do the rest of it. So ask me questions, and you can influence the rest of the lectures. Because I want to start off with the motivation, the main motivation for uh, supersymmetry, at least in a phenomenological context, of course, like this, which is the hierarchy problem. So we, it's a very common idea throughout all of physics that we don't, we're not dealing with exact theories, right? We, most theories that we have in physics are effective theories. They're approximate descriptions of the physics that are valid in a limited dynamical range, right? So for example, the Navier-Stokes equations that describe fluids are extremely successful in describing the detailed behavior of fluids, but it's clear that they have to break down at atomic distances. So for us, the question in particle physics, the question is, what is the status of the standard model of uh, particle physics? Is it an effective theory? Is it an exact theory? If it's an effective theory, what scale does it break down? Okay. And it's worth reminding ourselves that particle physics has been in a very privileged position for the last, I don't know, you know uh, 80, 90 years. Okay. In the 1930s, Fermi wrote down his theory of uh, beta decay, and he was made fun of by Oppenheimer and people like that, because this theory had a cross-section that grew with energy and therefore broke down at an energy scale of a TeV. That was in the 1930s. Okay? Then, of course, uh, there were the proposal that the weak interaction, instead of this silly model, we had a much more sophisticated model with Ws and Zs. But if we only have the Ws and Zs, then a different process, namely WW scattering, also has a quadratic growth in energy. In fact, it's parametrically exactly the same growth, and it also breaks down at a TeV. Now, this is good, right? It's fantastic to have the theory that you, the, the best tested theory that you know, break down at a finite scale and one that you can access experimentally. So, particle physics has been in this very, very privileged situation, and the LHC was built, and finally in 2012, the standard model Higgs was indeed discovered, okay? And that is exactly what's required to fix up this WW scattering, okay? And so, after having been in a situation where we knew there had to be new physics below the TeV scale, we're now in a situation, if we take the standard model with the Higgs, we can extrapolate this all the way up to the Planck scale, and there's no inconsistency. There's no guarantee of new physics, okay? And particle physicists are freaking out, right? A lot of people are freaking out. Um, but that's just the way it is. That's the normal situation in physics, actually, that we don't know that our theories necessarily break down, right? Classical mechanics broke down not because of any internal inconsistency of classical mechanics. It was just wrong, right? So we're in that situation now, too. The standard model doesn't break down at high energy scales, okay? So maybe should we consider it to be an exact theory? Well, we can't do that. Okay, because there are many, many phenomena that cannot be explained by the standard model. Okay, and I've listed some of them here. And there are some of these are just experimental facts. For example, neutrino masses and dark matter exist. We need to explain them. They're not explained in the standard model. Okay. Um, there are other things that are more theoretically motivated. So this is a list of these things. 
But one of the things about this list is that there's none of these things, there's only one of these here that really absolutely requires new physics at the TeV scale, which is the scale where we can do experiments right now. Okay, and that is the naturalness of the electroweak scale. Okay? Unfortunately, it's also probably the most theoretical and loosest of all of these things, but that's life. So let me explain what this is. Okay? So first of all, let's remind ourselves of some very basic things about dimensional analysis. Suppose we have some Lagrangian. Okay? And consider a coupling in that Lagrangian. It has some mass dimension. Right? We're using units where h bar and c are 1. Everything can be measured in mass. And I'll use these little brackets to give the mass dimension. So last mass dimension of n means that this coupling lambda is mass to some power. Okay? And so capital M is that mass scale. Now, imagine we treat this coupling as a perturbation. So we just do perturbation theory in that coupling. Okay? We would get some lowest order result, which is lambda to the 0, plus terms of order lambda to the one. And just by dimensional analysis, there has to be a power of some energy scale that appears there. That'll be some energy scale associated with the process, right? Some momentum transfer or the mass of an external state or something like that, okay? And what you can see is that dimensional analysis tells us where this perturbation is big and small, right? For n positive, positive mass dimension, the perturbation theory breaks down at small e. If n is negative, it breaks down at large e. And if n equals 0, it works at all energies, OK? And so we call these things relevant, irrelevant, and marginal couplings. That's the terminology introduced by Wilson, OK? And the thing to remember is that you have to remember there are certainly an infinite number of irrelevant couplings. And that's because the fields in our Lagrangian always have positive mass dimension, right? Scalars uh, and gauge bosons have mass dimension one. Um, fermions have mass dimension three halves. And so if you can, you can keep, what can you do? You can keep adding more fields and more derivative operators. And of course, you get extremely, uh, uh, you get couplings with extremely large negative mass dimensions. Okay, so how do we interpret this? How do we interpret the fact that we have all of these, these possible couplings that are allowed by, by the, the symmetries of the problem? Well, the, the sensible interpretation of this is that these terms arise from uh, new physics at some high mass scale, okay? So if these terms, if there's some new physics at some high mass scale, and if you integrate out that physics and write an effective Lagrangian only for the light degrees of freedom, you expect terms like this to be generated, but they'll be generated with a characteristic mass scale associated with that very high scale physics. Okay. Sorry. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Previous slide. Sure. Yes. At n equals zero, all, all the terms in the perturbation series will be one, 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 plus one, one, plus one. Oh, but I didn't, I mean, there's lambda itself. So lambda would have to be, lambda is a dimensionless number, okay? So I would have to, I couldn't really use this formula because m to the zero, you're right, would be one, okay? So I would have to write it as, as um, uh, I would have to put a little epsilon in front of this or something. Okay, yeah, but so for, for the dimensionless case, the parameter itself is dimensionless and it has to be a small number. Uh, for the dimension full case, you can see that the, the, the perturbation, whether the perturbation theory expansion works or not is controlled by whether the energy is large or small. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, sorry, do, do please interrupt me and I'm sorry if, I'm, if I'm, I'm, I'm a little jet lagged. I've just been up for 24 hours. So you might need to get my attention, but I really do, I appreciate uh, the questions very much. Okay. Um, okay. So, so the idea here is that that if we if our theory is an effective theory, if there's some new physics at some high scale m, then generically we expect an, an infinite number of higher dimension operators suppressed by powers of m. But the converse of this up here is that there's always only a finite number of relevant or marginal couplings. There's always a finite number of those. And those naturally dominate at low energies, OK? And those are the renormalizable couplings. And this is the view of Ken Wilson. This is the viewpoint of Ken Wilson about why renormalizable quantum field theories are good descriptions of nature, as we know they are, OK? And the standard model is, in a way, 
the perfect exemplar of this idea, of this philosophy, okay? It's a, the, the standard model is a truly amazing uh, thing if you boil it down, okay? Because you can define the standard model by saying that it's the most effective, the most, the, sorry, the most general Lagrangian that you can write in terms of these degrees of freedom, all of which we have experimentally observed now, right? These are the quark fields, the lepton fields, and now the, the Higgs uh, the Higgs field, and we assign them their, the gauge quantum numbers that they must have. That basically tells us how they interact with the spin one particles that we know are there in the standard model. We have three generations, and then we simply write down the most general Lagrangian involving with, 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 with relevant and marginal couplings that we can. That defines the standard model. We don't leave anything out. We don't impose any extra symmetries. That's it. So when I, when I teach the standard model, I always call this the standard model wallet card, because if you carry this around with you, you can, in principle, reconstruct all the physics of the standard model from this card. Okay, of course, you have to figure out what the parameters are by comparing with experiment, right? And this is really a long way from the, the original wallet card that was published by the particle data group had a lot of more experimental information in it, right? Because there was really not much of a theory that described the particle interactions that were known at that time. Now we can really summarize the theory in a, equally in a very, very succinct way. Okay? And this effective theory where we just put in everything that is allowed and don't leave anything out, put, you know, has an incredible number of successes, some of which you're learning about here at the school. I'm just going to list some of them. Uh, there are the weak decays of, of, the, of, the, of, of, of hadrons and leptons. Uh, quark mixing, CP violation, the intricate pattern of flavor changing effects, which can be summarized by saying that there are no flavor changing neutral currents. Also, the fact that there's a baryon and lepton number symmetry doesn't have to be put in, it just comes out. Okay? So, this is a perfect exemplar of what we want from an effective theory. We, just we write down the most general interactions we can, compatible with a few basic facts about the low energy world, and voila. Right? We agree with every experiment performed so far, unfortunately. Okay. So there's just one little problem with this story, okay? and that is the fact that the standard model actually, all the couplings in the standard model are in fact marginal. They're dimensionless parameters, except for one, which is the quadratic term for the Higgs, right? the Higgs mass term. So remember that that's negative. It's not the physical mass of the Higgs. The physical mass of the Higgs is, is minus 2 mh squared at, at tree level. But basically, we'll just refer to this as the mass of the Higgs. Okay? So that obviously has dimensions of mass. It's a relevant parameter. Okay? And so if we believe in this philosophy that the standard model arises from integrating out some new physics at some very high scale m, you have to ask the question, well, this dimensional analysis that was so successful in allowing us to neglect all these higher dimension operators, it suggests that mh squared should be of order this capital M. It should be huge, okay? So you can ask, okay, but that's just dimensional analysis. Is this really a problem? Okay? Because sometimes dimensional analysis fails. So this is a good way to do physics, right? You do dimensional analysis. If it really fails, then you found something interesting. Something, something, should, something should be happening to fix this up. Okay? Now, if we look at actual models, rather than just doing dimensional analysis, we start to see that this is not such an easy problem to get around. Okay? So suppose you just throw in a new particle, x, okay? and this cu pa particle couples to the Higgs. It has some coupling to the Higgs. And you can write down this one loop diagram. Okay? Now, forget about quadratic divergences, Divergence, bedervance, blah, 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 blah. okay? Forget about it, all right? Renormalize, they're gone, okay? But this particle X has a physical mass that you could go out and measure, which I'm assuming is much larger than the TeV scale, okay? We may not be able to do the experiment, but it's, we could. And so there's a finite correction, which is proportional to mx squared, okay? If you do this, if you do this, uh, this kind of diagram for model after model after model after model, okay? And the reason that you always find this to be non-zero in proportional to mx squared can be traced to the fact that if you look at this operator right here, this thing that we're correcting, this thing is invariant under all the symmetries of the problem. H dagger H is a completely a singlet. You can't somehow forbid it by imposing some symmetry. 
at least not very easily. Okay? And we do, in fact, expect particles like this. We, 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 we want particles like this to be there to address various problems that we have in physics. For example, uh, in the seesaw mechanism for neutrino masses, we might expect right-handed neutrinos at very high energy scales. If we believe in grand unification, we must have particles just like this with masses of order 10 to the 16 GeV. If we believe that, uh, that, 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 that quantum gravity takes place at high energy scales, we need some sorts of new particles like this, and they definitely have to couple to the Higgs because gravity couples to everything. Okay? And so at astronomically high scales, we believe we must have particles like this. Okay? And whenever we look at particles like this, they do give these kinds of contributions. On the other hand, experimentally, we need this parameter to be small. Okay? So we seem to require some enormous cancellation. This is many orders of magnitude larger than the observed values. We need some enormous unexplained cancellation. Okay, that is not an explanation of why dimensional analysis fails. That's just a failure of predictivity. Sorry, there's a question. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Can I go back to the slide before, please? Yes. Yeah, could it be that like the new particles, the contributions of the new particles at this very large scale, gut scale, Planck scale, whatever, could cancel each other directly? Like they could, they, they, they could, but we would want to know that there's some principle that underlies that, right? Because we could already, uh, that, that is true, we could, we could assume that they, are, they cancel, but then what would happen if you changed if you had two, an X and a Y particle that were both at the gut scale, they would have to cancel each other to fantastic accuracy. So if you changed the Y mass by 0.0000001%, the, cancel, the Higgs mass would be something completely different. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. There's another one behind you then. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Is this scenario that the, um, the very energetic particles coupled to the Higgs in... in, in coupling strengths like one over energy unrealistic so that this correction is always say order one or very small you're talking about these 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 uh, irrelevant operators from the from this previous slide or uh, I mean the diagram you don't know the coupling so if the well, coupling here, to the okay. Higgs becomes very weak at large energies okay so here I have assumed that this coupling here is a dimension less coupling okay so the the the, the motivation for that in all of these kinds of models, I need new particles that have a big effect on the Higgs. Okay, for example, in grand unification, the Higgs, the Higgs and all the other particles need to complete themselves into larger multiplets. Okay, and so there have to be particles like this that have couplings that are related to the standard model couplings. Okay, so for example, gauge, X gauge bosons whose gauge couplings are in fact equal to those of the standard model. So I'm, I'm, I'm suppressing many, many details here, but in, so for example, in, in grand unified models, there are very, very concrete reasons why these couplings have to be exist and even what their values are. So that's maybe the cleanest case. Uh, I understand, but if you abandon uh, grand unification, is there still a reason to assume that the coupling should be dimensionless? Well, if you, I think you would, if you, you could try to abandon all of these things, okay, and that's actually one of the options I'll talk about in the next slide. You could just say, well, I don't, I just don't want any new physics above the TeV scale at all, okay, and you can try to do that, and people have thought about that. So one of the, our job in facing these very basic fundamental problems, I think, is to try everything that makes sense, okay. So I'm going to, of course, be focusing on supersymmetry in these lectures, but there are many other things that have been tried. That's, that was my next slide, actually. Okay? So here, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just listing. This is the basic, what I've tried to describe here is the basic conundrum, the hierarchy problem. And here I'm just listing. I'm not going to talk about these, but I'm, uh, during the lectures, I'm happy to talk about anything uh, during coffee breaks or uh, in the discussion periods. Um, but some of the th ideas that have been enumerated that, in my opinion, make sense, okay? <laughs> um, uh, one, which is the one that we will be focusing on, is that, in fact, there is a symmetry that can forbid this term, namely supersymmetry. Um, the Higgs compositeness is the idea that there's basically a cutoff on the Higgs. The Higgs dissociates, um, and so it doesn't make any sense to talk about those diagrams above the high energy scale, and those, that will be discussed um, 
uh, by An Andrea Volzer uh, in this course, uh, some that I don't think will be uh, discussed in this course, you could just have, this is the option that you were talking about, there's just no physics, of new, new physics above the TeV scale, or the TeV scale is the fundamental scale of physics. That implies in particular you would need quantum gravity at a TeV scale. That's actually possible in the models with large extra dimensions. You could have anthropic uh, selections, and I misspelled it, and that's probably appropriate because I don't want to say anything about it. Um, and just to, as a proof that, you know, I, I, I've given many, many colloquia where I've said, you know, these are the only sensible ideas out there to the extent that they even are sensible. But just, uh, you know, not very long ago, there was a completely new idea proposed, which as far as I can tell makes sense. And I'm not going to talk about it at all, but it's a, a relaxation model. So that's a great inspiration for, you, for anyone who thinks that, you know, there might be some cool new ideas that nobody's thought of yet. Okay? Okay, but we're going to focus on the first one here, that, that in fact there is a symmetry that can, that can explain why this thing is, is zero. Okay? So to understand what the symmetry is, let's notice, first of all, let's notice that this, uh, the, standard, the standard model doesn't actually have any fermion mass terms in it, right? It has Yukawa couplings, which become fermion masses when you have VEBS. But let's suppose it did. Just suppose we add to it some, part, some, some fermions that have an explicit mass term in the Lagrangian. Then, we st even though that's a relevant interaction, we would not have the same problem that we have with the, the Higgs mass, with the scalar mass. And the reason, what we would find instead, if we, if we, if we had some X particle like this and we, and we, we looked at the corrections to the, to the mass of some fermion, we would find that the correction to the mass of the fermion is proportional to the mass of the fermion itself. So instead of being proportional to MX, it's proportional to M Psi. So this is not a problem at all, right? Okay, and why is this? The reason is because there's an extra symmetry in the limit where a fermion mass vanishes, right? There are extra chiral symmetries, and so the corrections have to be proportional to the parameter itself. They can't be additive corrections, okay? On the other hand, the scalar mass term doesn't have that character. If we set the scalar mass term to zero, there is not an additional symmetry that uh, uh, actually, that statement is actually not quite true. If you, if you, there's no other, no symmetry that's compatible with, for example, the quartic coupling and the Yukawa couplings. Okay, because you could have a shift symmetry, but anyway, there's no there's, there's nothing that forbids this that's compatible with the other couplings in the standard model that we know have to be there. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> so this term seems to be invariant under all symmetries, but supersymmetry, as we'll discuss finds a way of making this term not invariant, even though it looks like it's invariant under absolutely everything. And the basic idea is that supersymmetry is a symmetry between bosons and fermions. So in, the, in a supersymmetric theory, we have the Higgs doublet, and there's also a fermion doublet, something that has exactly the same quantum numbers as the, the, the Higgs, called a Higgsino. And there's a symmetry that relates the Higgs and the Higgsino properties. And the same for all the other particles of the standard model. Okay? And if you believe just for a second that there could be such a symmetry, then the point is, is that this symmetry requires that the mass of the scalar be the same as the mass of the fermion. Right? It makes sense that if the symmetry relates these two particles, they must have the same mass. Right? And once they're, uh, once they're forced to be equal by supersymmetry, then this chiral symmetry means that it's natural to have the Higgsino mass or the fermion mass be small, and therefore it must be natural to have the scalar mass be small. So this is the basic idea behind supersymmetry. And of course, we're going to be making this a lot more uh, precise. Okay. So now, of course, this symmetry between bosons and fermions, at minimum, it would require that there should be one boson for every fermion and vice versa with the same quantum numbers, and we don't observe that. So the symmetry must be broken, can't be exact in nature. And so if we look at, for example, if we look at how this works, if we, we look at the top quark, which is the particle that has the largest coupling to the Higgs, so this is sort of the biggest loop effect we could imagine that generates a Higgs squared mass. If we just calculate in the standard model this top loop, we would find that it's quadratically divergent. Okay, so we're supposed to renormalize that away. 
And then we find a term which is logarithmically divergent, proportional to the top fork mass. Okay? Now, everything that Ken Wilson has taught us tells us that we should actually take this lambda dependence seriously. And we see that in many, many models. And this quadratic dependence really does signal, even though it can be renormalized away, it signals the fact that you are sensitive to physics at very high scales, as we saw before with these X particles. Right? Now what you find in supersymmetry is that you have a scalar, and the scalar has couplings that look like these quartic couplings, but this quartic coupling here is equal to yt squared. So there's a factor of yt squared here, and it's the same, it's the same yt because of supersymmetry. And then this completely different diagram has an opposite sign quadratic divergence, which exactly cancels, signaling the fact that the quadratic sensitivity to high scales is canceled. And you have some term left over proportional to the mass of the particle going around this loop, the, the scalar partner of the top, which is called a stop, an S top. Right? And so the final thing, you get no quadratic divergence and you get a logarithmic sensitivity to high energy scales that can be parameterized by the renormalization group. And it's proportional to the difference of these two masses. So if these two, if the stop mass were equal to the top mass, even this logarithmic sensitivity would vanish. Okay? So this is the sort of paradigm for the way that supersymmetry is going to solve the hierarchy problem. There's no more quadratic dependence on high energy scales and we have a mild logarithmic dependence left. Questions on this? Yeah. Hello. If I just renormalize this lambda square away, why should I be still sensitive to it? Well, that goes back to these, these kinds of things right here, right? So in any concrete model, right, well, actually, I don't have to go back here, okay? So let's say that you say, who needs this stop? I'm going to take this stop mass to be 10 to the 16 GeV. Well, then you would have an enormous correction to the Higgs mass. So the claim is that, if, that in these models right here, in these models right here, well, in these models, as in any model, if you have very heavy particles, right, they will contribute to the, to the mass parameter of the Higgs. Okay, but if the new particles, the new heavy particles always come in pairs, like supersymmetries, may be valid at a very, very high scale, then I don't get this. Then these well, two the terms stop, could the cancel each other. This is the super partner of the top, not the super partner of something else. So you could, you could try to imagine a theory like that. No, yeah. Okay, yes. Good Where, luck. like, all new particles, which additional to these standard model particles, come in those pairs. That's right, but unless there was some principle guaranteeing that, supersymmetry cannot do that, because supersymmetry has to relate the top to something, which must be the stop, and then the stop cannot be too heavy. Okay, thanks. Right? So it would have to be, but there could be some other principle like that. That would be very interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, no, the no. last sentence on the slide says that uh, the mass stop should be smaller than TV, and it couples to Higgs. So shouldn't we have seen, the, sorry, the stop, of course not the top, shouldn't we have seen this particle in collisions then? Yes. And I'll talk more about that later, okay? I mean, that's a question of the extent of which that's a problem is going to be a major subject later on, so I'm not going to talk about it right now, okay? But that's an extremely important point, yes. It's a colored particle. It's supposed to be below a TeV scale. There's no excuse for not finding this, right? So let's... We will talk about it, okay? Okay, so now things are going to get, uh, get a little bit more technical. There's going to be more, equa there are going to be equations with actual equal signs and indices, okay? So warning, we're shifting modes here. Um, and there's, I don't think there's any better way to start off a set of uh, lectures to graduate students than by invoking the great Sidney Coleman, who gave such magnificent lectures in Eriche, which I never had the privilege to attend, but I certainly read many of them. And uh, Sidney was also famous for, for, for many witty things that he said, and this is very true. The career of a young theoretical physicist consists of treating the simple harmonic oscillators in ever-increasing levels of abstraction. And these lectures on supersymmetry will be no exception. Okay? So let's just let's look at the very, very simplest concrete example of supersymmetry. Okay? 
So uh, the very simplest quantum mechanical model that we can think of is a simple harmonic oscillator. And I'm going to have, so this is the, the Hamiltonian for simple harmonic oscillators. These Bs are the standard creation and annihilation operators. I call them Bs instead of As because B is boson. This is a normal bosonic simple harmonic oscillator. What makes it bosonic is that you can have any excitation number you want, right? And remember that when you go to quantum field theory, a free quantum field theory is just one simple harmonic oscillator for every spatial momentum. And the fact that we have any number of levels is exactly the statement that you can have any number of particles with the same momentum. So this really is a boson. This really is, means a boson. Okay, and we have the vacuum and the excited states in, defined in the normal way. This is all should be very familiar. Okay? We can do the same thing. We can define a fermionic simple harmonic oscillator by defining uh, creation and annihilation operators F that satisfy anti-commutation relations. Sorry, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, because that should be zero. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just a typo. Yeah, that should be zero. I'll try to remember to fix that before I post the slides. Yes, thank you. Okay? I'm glad somebody's awake. All right? Um, here, I fixed it, right? So for the, the fermionic creation and annihilation operators, uh, satisfy anti-commutation relations, okay? And if this is not familiar, this, this is familiar to you whether you realize it or not because in free fermionic quantum field theory, every, every moment, spatial momentum mode is one of these kinds of harmonic oscillators, okay? So this really is a fermionic, fermionic simple harmonic oscillator. Now, because the creation operator squared vanishes, you only have two states, zero and one. Right? And that makes sense. In a, in a free fermionic field theory, you have two states for every spatial momentum. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. Can't put more than one particle in a state. Okay? So that's a, and now we're just going to combine them. We're just going to put them both into the same Hamiltonian. We just add the two Hamiltonians together. The bosonic guys commute with the uh, fermionic guys. Okay? So these two sets of operators don't talk to each other at all. And now we just have states labeled by how many bosons we have and how many fermions we have, right? Just by acting with the appropriate creation and annihilation operators. Now, the frequencies of these uh, two harmonic oscillators are free parameters, but the claim is that if we choose them to be equal, then we have a Bose-Fermi symmetry, okay? And the simplest way that we can see that is we just look at the spectrum, right? Because if we look at these states, if they have the same frequency omega, then the energy of these states is just the sum, is proportional to the sum of the bosonic and fermionic occupation numbers, right? And so we have a spectrum like this. We have a ground state, which is a unique state. The first excited state could be either one boson and no fermions or zero bosons and one fermion. The next excited state could be two bosons, no fermions, one boson, one fermion, and so on. Okay? And so we have this exact degeneracy between, we have the ground state is unique, but every other state, there's a, there's a, there's, there's, there's a double degeneracy. Okay? And as always in quantum mechanics, these degeneracies are due to, are, 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 are due to symmetries. Okay? And um, to see that it's actually a symmetry, you can define the operator, the sort of obvious operator that would take you between these two states that have the same energy. Namely, you have something that annihilates a boson and creates a fermion, annihilates a boson and creates a fermion. A bos annihilates a fermion and creates a boson. See, I told you I was jet lagged. Okay? So the obvious thing, and you can see that what this thing does is it, well, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. And it's very easy to figure out that this thing commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay, you just do a, a little calculation to see that. And then also an interesting fact is that if you square this operator Q, you get the Hamiltonian up to a factor. So this operator Q is the square root of the Hamiltonian in some sense. Okay. So this extremely simple model right here, this is exactly what supersymmetry is going to be. Okay? It's going to relate particle fermionic and bosonic particle states exactly the way this Q does. Any questions on this? Yeah. Yes, you can, but for field theory, that's not really a useful way to, to do it, because in field theory, we really care about the particle basis, right? Even in the simple harmonic oscillator, 
who needs P and Q when you can have A and A dagger, right? Well, P is, I mean, Q is basically A plus A, A plus I, A dagger, or P is A minus I, A dagger, or the other way around, I forget, right? Um, or plus or minus A dagger, whatever. I don't even know, I, I've forgotten. But it's, you know, they're, they're, they're just, some P and Qs are just simple linear combinations of A and A dagger. <laughs> okay. I'd have to turn on my brain to figure out what they are, and that's, that's not happening. Okay. I had my brain on when I wrote these slides, so I'm, I'm outsourcing my, uh, my thinking here. <laughs> are, any, other, any, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so this is just what I said. This is literally true. Free field theory is literally just one harmonic oscillator for every spatial momentum. So this is, this is not just some silly toy model. And so then you can immediately say, well, wow, then I, I can easily imagine uh, theories where this works. So if I just take a Dirac fermion, because that's what I know, and I have now a Dirac fermion has four particle states for each momentum, each three momentum, right? So I'm going to need four, four bosonic states, right, for every momentum. So I just put in four real scalars just by hand. And of course, I have to have their masses, the mass of the fermion and the mass of the scalar be the same, right, so that the energy levels are the same. And so this is a supersymmetric theory. In fact, it has a non-minimal supersymmetry, which is why we're not going to uh, study this theory. Okay? So, these, so th this, this really can be translated directly into to, to free field theory. But we want to actually study the minimal supersymmetry, and so we have to talk about uh, minimal fermions, which are not direct fermions, and that's what I'm going to do next. Okay? Any questions before I do that? Okay, so I'm going to talk... Uh, a little bit about vial fermions. Okay. So the inevitable note on conventions, I am actually trying to keep factors of i, minus 1, 2, square root 2, and so on. I'm using what I think are the most standard conventions that I can use. Um, this reference right here is a wonderful resource for all kinds of uh, details and results, and uh, I highly recommend it. And uh, like I said, I believe conventions should be conventional. Um, that also means the corollary of that is that if you don't like some of these conventions, don't blame me, okay? I didn't make them up. Okay, so what are vial fermions? Vial fermions are the minimal fermions in four dimensions, okay? So they are the basic building blocks for all other kinds of fermions, including Dirac, Majorana, everything, okay? So let's start with the Dirac representation. The reason for starting with the Dirac representation is that it exists in any number of dimensions and even any signature. It's completely universal, so it's a good starting point in any dimension to find out what the minimal fermions are. So let's go through that in the case of four dimensions. So we have our gamma matrices, and they have this famous anti-commutation relation, and then Dirac's Insight was that these, if you take the commutator, you get an anti-symmetric matrix, which is the generator of the Lorentz group, which is a generator of the Lorentz group, okay? So whenever you can find Dirac matrices, you can find a new uh, representation of the Lorentz group, okay? And so the way this works for infinitesimal transformations, Lorentz transformations, we write the Lorentz transformation as the identity plus a small piece, omega mu nu, and the fermion then transforms as the same omega mu nu multiplied by these generators acting on the uh, Dirac spinner. Okay? So this part is hopefully familiar, or at least hopefully at least rings bells from your quantum field theory course. Okay? <clears throat> So for finite transformations, we just exponentiate the transformations, and the Dirac bar transforms in the inverse representation. Okay, this is also a classic part. Any, any discussion of Dirac fermions will show this in, in, in some form. Okay? Now the way I want to look at this is I want to think about this in terms of an index notation. Okay? So I want to think about uh, Dirac fields as having an index A that goes from 1 to 4. It's a Dirac spinner index. And these matrices S, which are the exponentials of these uh, omega times uh, generators, um, 
these guys have an index structure like this, and the inverse guy has an index structure like this. This is just exactly what you do with Lorentz transformations when you have Lorentz transformations acting on the fundamental representation. I'm using exactly the same kind of index notation here. And just as it's very useful to have upper and lower Lorentz indices to keep track of Lorentz invariance, it'll be useful to have upper and lower spinner indices to keep track of uh, invariance, okay? And the way, remember that we keep track of Lorentz invariance is that we match the indices, right? Everything transforms according to its index structure, and we can do exactly the same thing for fermions. So for example, the gamma matrix has this index structure. It has a mu, then it has two spinner indices, right? Because it's a matrix. And now the claim is that this thing right here is it transforms according to its index structure, except that it doesn't transform. Namely, it's an invariant tensor, okay? So to illustrate that concept, let me just remind you that this is something you actually know. Uh, in the case of Lorentz transformations in the fundamental representation, you know that the space-time metric, eta mu nu, is an invariant tensor, because if I were to transform it, I would transform it by, this, by, this, by these lambdas, but that's in fact equal to the original thing. Okay? And the fact that omega mu nu is an invariant tensor like this is the basic reason why contracting upper and lower indices gives you an invariant. Okay? So exactly all of that transform, uh, translates over to the spinner case. This thing right here is an invariant tensor, the gamma matrix, Dirac gamma matrix. And in this case, it means a more complicated identity like this, where the mu index transforms by a Lorentz transformation, the upper A index transforms by an S, and the lower B index transforms by an S inverse. Okay? So these, go, these, ex, these kinds of expressions look complicated, the whole Christmas tree of indices, but if you just, the idea is very simple. Every index just transforms according to its, its, its position. Okay? And so in this way, you can easily see that all the various invariants that you know for Dirac matrices can be thought of as just arising in this way of contracting upper and lower indices. Okay, any questions on that? Now, <clears throat> the Dirac representation though, as I said, it's not the minimal representation and the way we see that is there's a basis called the Weyl basis for the gamma matrices where they look like this, okay, and in that basis, if I look at the commutator of two uh, gamma matrices, I look at the Lorentz generators, they are block diagonal. So whenever you see this two by two notation here for Dirac guys, this is a two by two block structure. And because these guys are block diagonal, it means the upper two components and the lower two components transform under Lorentz transformations completely independently, right? They're, they're their own representation individually. So the Dirac representation is reducible, and these matrices here are given by formulas like this, okay? So a lot of this notation is standard, and I know that I'm, I'm going over it fast, but uh, you can, uh, these no notes will be posted, and there's, uh, there'll be a lot of reference material on as well. Okay, so as I said, the upper two components and the lower two components transform, in, they transform among themselves, so I have these left-handed vial spinners and these right-handed vial spinners that transform in this way. And now, just as for the Dirac fields, I want to have an index notation for these. So I write the left-handed uh, guys with a lower alpha index and the right-handed guys with an upper dotted index. And again, like I said, don't blame me for this uh, notation. This is a standard notation, okay? Uh, there is actually reasons for it, but anyway, uh, this is what it is, okay? And you should just think, you shouldn't think of dot as an operation on alpha, you should just think of it as another alphabet. There's the dotted Greek alphabet because we're, we're running low on alphabets, okay? Okay, and so here, once again, are, here are these same equations here written out with the index structure, okay? So these are just the same equations and you can see upper and lower indices are nicely lined up. The finite transformations, the same way, they exponentiate, they have this index structure, okay? And now I can just define something with any number of upper dotted, upper undotted, lower undotted, lower dotted indices to transform in the way that they're supposed to. Namely, uh, if there's a lower, lower uh, undotted index, it transforms according to this S. If there's an upper undotted index, it has to transform with an S inverse. Here it is, okay? All right, so this is, again, just the way you would do it for Lorentz, 
with, different, with an addition of a couple of different new kinds of alphabets. All right, so I hope that's okay. And once again, you can show that all of these various objects that we introduce, just like the gamma matrices, they are invariant objects in the sense that they are equal to the thing that you get by transforming all of their indices. Okay? And there's another invariant tensor, which is, uh, which is this, the anti-symmetric two by two matrix. Okay? So this has two upper spinner, two, two of the same kind of spinner indices, either upper or lower, and it's anti-symmetric. Um, yeah. Okay, it's an anti, it's anti-symmetric. And you can check that it also is an invariant tensor, namely it satisfies this. Okay? And the proofs of these things are basically just by checking. They're two by two matrices, so you just check, and they're also given in many places. All right, but that's what I wanted to say about that. Okay? All right. So here's the summary, the executive summary. Uh, we have these new kinds of spinners. They have two components. So these indices, alphas and alpha dots, run from one to two. And we have all these different kinds of invariant tensors. Okay? And the rules are you can form Lorentz invariants if you just contract all the different kinds of indices that you have. Okay? And here's what I'm saying here. You can check these identities by... Uh, you, it, it, you, it, it's, it's smart to use identities like this, for example. This identity is very easy. Sorry, where is it? Uh, Anyway, I don't know. You can ch here, this identity here. This is a smart identity to check first, and you can use this to prove all the other identities involving the sigma matrices. Okay? One last thing is that charge conjugation actually relates the dotted and the undotted indices. And the reason for that is that if you complex conjugate the sigma generator, you get the sigma bar generator. Uh, I didn't mention, and again, this is notation is is conventional, so don't blame me. Bar doesn't necessarily mean complex conjugation unless I tell you that it does. So for example, sigma mu bar has nothing to do with sigma mu. I mean, at least not, it, it's not the complex conjugate of it. Okay? On the other hand, you can see that the sigma mu nu bar is closely related to the, uh, and there should be, there should be a, this should be an alpha dot. I apologize. I'll fix, this, I'll fix these typos before I put this online. This should be an alpha dot. Okay? So it makes sense to write things like this. If I take a lower uh, index, a lower index spinner, and I complex conjugate it, it turns it into a dotted index spinner. Okay? Because of this relation, this transforms just like a dotted index. And so the basic point is, is that I can make all the different kinds of spinners out of the vial spinners with a single lower dotted index because I can raise the index with epsilon alpha beta, so I get an upper spinner index. If I want a lower dotted index, I just complex conjugate it. If I want an, uh, this should read, I'm trying to raise the index here. I'm trying to say, <laughs> okay. I wanted to hear what I wanted to write is that if you wanted an upper dotted index, you can raise the dotted index with epsilon alpha beta of the dagger thing. Okay, so I'll, again, I'll fix these things before I post them. Okay? Questions? All right. Finally, now, we can use this to write some Lagrangians. Okay? So let's write some invariant Lagrangians. So let's write the most general quadratic Lagrangian for a single vial spinner uh, psi alpha. Okay? And uh, we can see that we can write this very Dirac-ish kinetic term. We just use psi dagger and psi. We contract the indices, out, these, these dotted and undotted indices with a sigma bar mu. And we have a derivative here. Okay? And um, this looks just like the, the Dirac kinetic term. And then for a mass term, we mix a psi with a psi because we have the, the metric that we have involves two... Uh, uh, two spinner indices of the same type. Okay? All right? Yes? No, don't apologize. So I am not going to talk about parity and all of those things. I have to leave, there are many things I have to leave out for lack of time. Okay? So when I talk about, when I say Lorentz invariant, I'm just going to mean the connected component of the Lorentz group, namely boosts. Okay, so you know what 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 Einstein the, the symmetry of space-time is is clearly must include boosts 
and, uh, and, and, and translations and rotations, right? But it need not contain parody and time reversal and those other things. It may or may not. Well, that's what I've written here. Now, Psi is a left-handed uh, vial fermion. So that's what I've written. Yeah, yeah. So these, this is a single, that's exactly what this is. Okay? I've just left off the, let, the L. Okay? So I didn't, I didn't say that, but I, I'm, I just started leaving. Oh, these are all left-handed vial spinners. I should have said left-handed here. Okay? The, the, the ones with a single un, lower undotted index are the left-handed guys. And notice one thing is that if we look at this mass term right here, this, this mass term would be zero if psi was a commuting classical field. So if we think of psi as a classical field, right, normally we think of Lagrangians as being classical and then we quantize them. So if we think of this as a classical field, this mass term would actually vanish identically because epsilon alpha beta is anti-symmetric, right, and psi alpha psi beta would be symmetric, so this would vanish. So just even having this mass term requires that these fields actually anti-commute, okay? But that's actually what they're supposed to do. In canonical quantization, the fermion fields have to obey anti-commutation relations, so we can understand this from the fact that the h-bar goes to zero limit of the operators should reduce to the classical fields, okay? Um, this, is, this is usually sloughed over in most treatments of, 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 uh, of quantum field theory, but it's true. Um, more conventionally, <clears throat> what is usually not sloughed over is if you want to write a path integral for fermions, it's a, the fermion path integral is over anti-commuting fields, okay? But I claim that even if you think about canonical quantization carefully, you will see that you have to have anti-commuting classical Lagrangian that you're canonically quantizing, okay? All right. Finally, we need to check the, the, that the Lagrangian is Hermitian, so that the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, okay? And we need the definition, we need to figure out what is the definition of complex conjugation for anti-commuting uh, classical fields. And we want that definition to agree, again, we want the, 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 the classical fields to be the h-bar goes to zero limit of the classical fields, so we have to make the rules agree. And one of the things about complex conjugating operators is that it reverses the order of the operators, regardless of any commutation or anti-commutation relation they obey, right? So we have to actually define complex conjugation of spinners to reverse the order of spinners, even for the classical anti-commuting fields, okay? And then we can actually check, and I'm not going to go through these things because this is not a calculation you should do when you're jet lagged. You're guaranteed to get the wrong sign 50% of the time. But, you know, you, it's, it is instructive once or twice in your life to go through and do some of these calculations and just see how many sign flips there are that you can get wrong, okay? And there are plenty of them, okay? But the claim is that if you get them all right, you will find that these objects which sort of Anyway, they, they, things work, okay? So the Lagrangian is, in fact, Hermitian. Now, a lot of times, <clears throat> you know, these, these expressions with all these spinner indices will dazzle your eyes, and so, so it's, it's useful to sometimes omit the spinner indices. You get much cleaner-looking expressions, and it turns out that, that, that you always get the dotted and undotted spinner indices contracted in these, these directions, okay? And you can see some examples of this here, okay? So that was sort of a lightning introduction to, uh, to uh, two-index spinnerology. I gave you a reference if you want to learn more. This is a very useful exercise here if you want to understand how to quantize that theory uh, of a single vial fermion. Uh, this exercise, like I said, I'll post these slides. This exercise sort of walks you through the main steps. Okay, and the bottom line is that there is a mode expansion for this guy in terms of these uh, A and B daggers. There's a single uh, annihilation and a single creation operators here. So this, uh, this massless vial fermion describes uh, two physical uh, states. Okay, and uh, yeah, you can, uh, you, can, you can have fun with this. Okay, but I'm not gonna go through it here. Okay, 
So any questions on that? OK. So now I want to talk about supersymmetry, actually supersymmetry in quantum field theory. Okay? And now we can talk about the minimal, we can talk about the minimal uh, theory that has supersymmetry in four dimensions. We have the minimal fermion, right? A left-handed vial fermion. And so to match the number of degrees of freedom, we need two real uh, scalars, which we can assemble into a single complex scalar. So now the number of degrees of freedom matches, okay? And I'm going to take the mass terms to be equal, namely zero. I'm going to take them both to be massless, okay? Let's take the very, very simplest theory, okay? And I'm going to show that this, in fact, has a, a supersymmetry. This, this, this theory has a supersymmetry. Now, one thing to notice that will help us in guiding, uh, guiding us in finding this is that this Lagrangian here actually has a U1 symmetry under which the fermion and the scalar have the same charge. So again, if these guys are going to be related by some sort of a symmetry, it sort of makes sense that they should have the same U1 charge, okay? So that will be a guiding principle that will help us, okay? So in fact, what we're going to do is we're gonna to try to find a supersymmetry, an invariance of this Lagrangian, and it should have the property that the variation of the scalar should be like the fermion, the variation of the fermion should be like the scalar, right? It should exchange fermions and bosons. Obviously, the Lorentz and the spinner indices have to match up. It has to, a scalar has to go to a scalar, not some other, you know, beast, and so on. And we want everything to be compatible with this U1 invariance right here, okay? And if you do the exercise of writing the most general thing that you can, then for the scalar, you find that you, you get a term like this, okay? It has to be some, there, there's, when, whenever you have a transformation, there has to be a parameter, right, of the transformation. Like for the U1 field, there was the angle theta. Now here, this, fer, this is a scalar, this is a boson, this is a fermion, so the, spin, the parameter has to be a spinner. It has to be an anti-commuting field. So this is a well-defined mathematical object, but you can't say how big it is. You can't measure, it's not a real number, it's an anti-commuting thing. And you see, I can't have a psi dagger term in here because of the U1 symmetry that I assumed, okay? And if I look at this now, I see that, well, the, the scalar has dimension one, the fermion has dimension three halves, so this mysterious transformation parameter has mass dimension minus a half, okay? So it's the square root of a length. All right? And then I can write down the most general fermion transformation that I can. And if you think about it, then this is the only way, again, it can, you can only have a phi here, not a phi dagger, okay? And this is the only way to hook up the Lorentz indices. And I put an arbitrary factor C here. I could have put a factor C here, but I can just absorb it into xi, right? Now I can compute, now that I've written down the most general thing, I can just compute the variation of the Lagrangian, okay? And I can see that the, I can compute the, 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 the variation of the kinetic term. And for the scalar and for the fermion, for the fermion, you have to do a little bit of work, not very much, but you have to do some indexology. You have to integrate by parts. Question. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Thanks for waking. Ah, what do I mean by this right here? I'm sorry, yeah, this is, uh, here what I mean is just, is d mu is just shorthand for d by dx mu. Is that what you're quoting? Ah, okay, I'm sorry, yeah, I could, I, let me slow down a little bit here. Thank you for slowing me down and waking me up. Okay, so uh, one thing I notice uh, is, so first of all, if I tried to, let's try to write something without a derivative, okay? Let's try to write something without a derivative, okay? So then we would have to write del psi, this has a spinner index, okay? And now this has no indices at all, okay? Now you could try to write xi alpha like this, right? So you could try to write it without derivatives. But now if you look at the dimensional analysis, this guy has dimension minus, this guy right here has dimension equal to one half. This guy has dimension equal to one, okay? So I haven't actually thought this thing all the way through. Uh, maybe there's some better argument, okay? But I would like the transformation not to involve any dimensionful parameter, 
Okay, so the only other object that I can put in here is a derivative to make it dimensionally correct. Yeah, it's also the thing that ultimately works, you know. So there, there are actually, I'm not going to discuss it here, there are, there are very fancy theorems that tell you that this is the only possible sort of uh, symmetry that you can have, which we'll see at the end that this doesn't commute with space-time symmetries, and this is, you can, there, there are theorems that tell you that, that this is the only thing you can write down. Um, I wouldn't claim what I'm doing here is a proof, but I'm at least, I think I'm trying to motivate it strongly. Okay, that this form is the, is the right form. Okay? All right? So, yeah, anyway, the, the, once I have this derivative, to, uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can work out the, uh, the, the change in the, the, the fermion kinetic term. And now to, to see, after integration by parts, I get something like this. Okay? So this started off with one derivative. I integrated by parts to put both the derivatives on phi. And now I have two sigma matrices like this. Now notice that this is symmetric in mu and nu. So I can symmetrize this under mu and nu and use this identity right here, okay? And then when I do that, what I find is I, I, this thing simplifies and I get something like this, okay? So it's, uh, you can see that it's, you know, it's, not, it's not immediate, but you do a few steps and you can actually see that the fermion kinetic term changes into this, and that now tells us what C needs to be, okay? For, to be invariant, C needs to be minus I, as it turns out. And so here is our transformation right here, okay? All right? Okay, and this is a supersymmetry transformation. This is a, a transformation that uh, this theory is invariant under when we have both the fermion and the boson have zero mass. Now that we have a... Um, should have put a box around this. Uh, now that we have the symmetry, we can work out what the Noether current is, okay? It's another tedious calculation, but you can, it's a standard calculation. Using canonical methods, you can find that the Noether current looks like this. So rather than deriving it, let's just check that this is in fact invariant, uh, that it's conserved when we, uh, when we impose the equations of motion. If we take its divergence, we get a term where the derivative hits the fermion, and a term where the derivative hits the scalar. So if we look at the term where the derivative hits the fermion, if we look carefully, we see that that vanishes on the equations of motion because we have a sigma bar, alpha, beta, del mu, psi, beta. That's exactly the combination that vanishes according to the equation of motion for the scalar, uh, fermion. For the, for the boson piece, we again use this trick. We get these two, uh, two uh, derivatives on the scalar, we can symmetrize these mu nu indices, we get something proportional to box of the scalar, which again is zero by the equations of motion. Okay? So this is in fact conserved on classical solutions. And that means now we can, we can, we can uh, compute the charge associated with this. We just take the spatial integral of the zero component of the charge. Right? So notice that this charge has an extra spinner index here. Right? So um, there are many signs throughout all of this that, uh, that supersymmetry is really a space-time symmetry. It looks kind of abstract because it has these fermion, uh, these fermion parameters, but here's one way in which it's a space-time symmetry. The Noether current has an additional space-time index on it, namely a spinner index. Right? So the, uh, the charge that you form from this also has an extra spinner index. It's a spinner charge, okay? And it's given by the, the integral, spatial integral over the zero component. And classically, uh, this charge is, is conserved. It's time independent on classical solutions, okay? But we don't care about classical solutions. We care about the quantum theory. So for the quantum theory, what we do is we just expand these fields uh, there's an alpha here. And who wrote these slides? Okay. Um, yeah, obviously there's no alpha index here. So there's a, um, it's copy and paste, I guess. So, um, so anyway, the, the, the vial fermion field has a mode expansion, okay? And there are some spinner solutions here, uh, which are solutions to the uh, vial equation, just like in the Dirac case, you're used to having U's and V's, which are solutions to the free Dirac equation. Here, these guys are solutions to the vial equation. So we have some mode expansion for these guys. I call A's and B's the 
creation and annihilation operators for the fermion, and C and D are the creation and annihilation operators for the uh, scalar. Okay? And now I can just compute. I just take these expressions here without the index, spurious index on the scalar, and I just plug into, the, into this expression and integrate, okay? and I do some manipulations, and I find, voila, I find Q and Q dagger are given by these expressions right here. Okay? And notice that these have exactly the structure that we had in our very, very simple harmonic oscillator example, right? We had a, bo a single boson and fermion thing. We have a, this is a bosonic creation and a fermionic annihilation, a fermionic creation, bosonic annihilation. This is exactly a thing that takes away one boson and gives you a fermion or takes away one fermion and gives you a boson, okay? And it nicely is weighted by this, uh, this, this spinner solution here to give you take care of the indices, okay? And similarly for the daggered guy. Okay? Any questions? Yes? That's right. So then space time is not what we would call right? It's, it's something else. Yes, hold on to that thought. Sort of, hold on to that thought. <laughs> well, we'll say more about that later, okay? So, so we'll see what, what I mean. The, the, natural, the natural setting where all of this acts like Lorentz symmetries act on space-time is called superspace, and that's something we'll talk about. Okay? All right? But now that we have these things, we have completely explicit expressions for these Qs and Q daggers. They're made of these creation and annihilation operators. These creation and annihilation operators obey commutation and anti-commutation relations that we know. Okay? Um, and so now we can, let's see, what am I saying here? Oh yeah, let's, sorry, so before we do that, before we, okay, so let's, let's look at what these Qs do to states, okay? So how do we define a single fermion state? We act with an A dagger or a B dagger, right? That creates respectively a fermion or an anti-fermion. Similarly, we get a scalar by acting with C dagger and an anti-scalar by acting with a D dagger. Right? This is the standard way we define particle and antiparticle states for complex fields. Okay? And now we can just work out exactly what these Qs do. And you can see what they do. They take a fermion state and turns it into a scalar state. The Q takes an antifermion state and annihilates it, but the Q dagger does the opposite. It, takes, it annihilates a fermion state, and acting on an antifermion state gives you an anti-scalar. Ah, this should be a phi here. Lots of typos, okay? This should be a phi. It's supposed to turn anti-fermions into an anti-scalar, okay? And then similarly here, uh, if you act on a bosonic state, the Q annihilates the, the scalar, but the Q on an anti-scalar gives you an anti-fermion, and then vice versa here, okay? So, all right? So these Qs do exactly what, what they were advertised to do. They create, take one boson state, turn it into a one fermion state, et cetera, okay? All right, so this is what supersymmetry is in a very, very concrete form, okay? So next thing I wanted to talk about, the algebra, so I'm heading my way towards talking about this as uh, symmetry, but any questions? So I think I'm just going to, um, I'm going to start this subject I'll just because uh, I want to stop in about three minutes and then we'll just use the last 15 minutes for uh, questions, okay? So um, as I was starting to say before, I got a little bit ahead of myself, you know, we can work out the, uh, the, the anti-commutator of these two guys. I don't know why there's a prime there. Who wrote these slides? I have no idea, okay. Anyway, there's not supposed to be a prime there. Um, what? Sorry? Say again? Oh yeah, the, oh it's a comma. Ah, ah, thank you. Yes, oh, very good, yes. 
from, from where you're sitting, it looks more like a comet. <laughs> okay, uh, anyway, uh, so, so you can work out this anti-commutator, and because we know the algebra of all the A's and C's, this is a standard sort of an exercise, and then what you find is brrrp, you find this right here, okay? So you find that you can write it, you, can, you find that you get a combination like this, which basically is the sum, which is a sum of terms that counts the number of uh, each kind of particle. And actually, this is also not quite correct because this is what it is. Okay. For the, there, there are two terms here involving fermions, and for those terms, they are multiplied by this. And each of these, no, 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 this is correct. No, this is correct. You get, you get each of these things involves one U and one U dagger because each of these terms involves at least one, involves two, non-zero terms involves one fermion and one, one fermionic creation and one fermionic annihilation operator. And um, that's actually not quite right. Anyway, it comes out proportional to this and you get this, okay? So uh, I'm gonna just uh, uh, stop here and just say that we have, remember for the very, very simple uh, supersymmetric harmonic oscillator, we had that, that Q was the square root of the Hamiltonian. We had Q squared equals H. Well, things can't be quite that simple in our Lorentz invariant theory, right? Because these Qs have spinner indices. But if you look at this thing right here, P mu is the generator of space-time translations. So P zero is the Hamiltonian, right? And Q, this anti-commutator is like a square, so this is, is sort of a covariant, Lorentz covariant version of saying that we have, that these Qs are square roots of translations. Okay, space-time translations. And so that is yet another way to say that these are space-time symmetries. You clearly think that P mu is a space-time symmetry, right? But you can get a space-time translation by anti-commuting two of these weird supersymmetry operators. Okay? So I think that's a good place to start for now, stop for now. <laughs> okay. Good place to start next time. Oh, thank you. <laughs>